All right, well, let me share my screen. Um, I don't see, hold on. This. I'm gonna have to redo it. That's not the one we want. This is what we want. <clears throat> All right, can everybody see the PowerPoint? Yes. Yes. All right, very good. Thank you all for responding because my, when my internet starts going out, I, I don't know if y'all can hear me. It happened earlier in AMP1 lab. All right, so basically what I have here for you, and I, I, I literally just did it a few minutes ago. That's why I was like a couple of minutes late coming in. I got my, my lecture PowerPoint and just, you know, truncated it, T took some slides out, uh, left some slides in so that we have something to go by. So I could teach you about the anatomy of the system a little bit, but, but also the physiology, physiology that's going on. All right. So the urinary system, the gross anatomy of it, all the organs and tubes and everything are quite simple. I mean, everybody knows you have two kidneys. I mean, you know, we just know that. Leading from the kidneys, we have a tube, one for each kidney. It's called a ureter. So you have two of them. And the ureters carry urine from the kidney down to the temporary storage site, which is our urinary bladder. So you have one urinary bladder, and then you have one final tube that leads from the bladder out of the body, which urine exits our body through. We excrete urine through out of the body through the urethra. The kidney is really has one product that it, it one major thing that it's really going to make dealing with uh, filtering the blood. Everybody knows the kidneys filter the blood. The product after everything's done through three physiological steps, the product is called urine. Now the kidney makes some other molecules for us we learned about in the past, like renin, uh, erythropoietin, calcitriol. We learned some of those names in the past. But as far as regulating homeostasis, the urinary system that you see here with the kidneys and the ureters and the urinary bladder and, and, and the urethra, the kidneys regulate all aspects of the blood, all aspects of it. All the concentrations of electrolytes, everything, which I'm about to show you. The kidneys are involved in regulating that. We, on, we only are supposed to have a certain amount of each thing in the blood. So the kidney, if we have too much of something, the kidney excretes it in urine. If we don't have enough of something, the kidneys have to save it and put it back in the blood. I'm going to show you briefly how that's achieved. But the kidneys are, are fairly special with regards to the other organs in the body. They actually lie posterior to our abdominal wall. So your, your, intest, your small intestine, large intestine, your liver, all of that sits in your abdominal cavity. You guys know that. And lining the back of it is a tissue. There's a tissue sheet behind it. Well, lying behind that sheet, but in front of your back muscles and everything are the kidneys. So they're actually referred to as retroperitoneal because they line behind the posterior wall of, of the peritoneum. So you'll see that name in your engage manual, retroperitoneal. Uh, and obviously we learned about the adrenal glands just to point them out since we see it here, they lie on top of our kidneys, right? So as far as the functions of the kidney are concerned, there's many of them, many. The kidney regulates all aspects of the blood regulates how, how concentrated the ions are in the blood. And here I just listed out a few, a couple that, you know, a few that you recognize, but there's many more than that. The kidneys, along with the lungs, also regulate our blood pH. That's a pH regulation at what we call the organ level. So the only two organs in the body that directly are involved in regulating the pH of the blood 
are the lungs and the kidney. And so the kidney is going to regulate pH by altering how much hydrogen, which is acid, and how much bicarbonate, which is a main buffer in the body, is either excreted in urine or saved in the blood. This concept is going to be, we're going to talk about this concept in more detail next week, because obviously we're doing acid-base balance next week. So how much hydrogen means something, how much bicarbonate means something, we're going to cover that next week. But the kidneys regulate it, right? If we have too much acid in the blood, the kidneys can excrete acid out in urine. And for that matter, if our blood's too acidic, the kidneys can make and or reabsorb bicarbonate into the blood. And that bicarbonate buffers the acid, which can help bring our pH back to normal. So that's some concepts we're going to cover next week. The one that a lot of people are fairly familiar with is water balance. The kidneys excrete water out in urine. I mean, the main, main, it's a fluid of our urine. So the kidneys regulate how much water is in your blood. If we have too much water in our blood, which you can have, that's what we call that overhydration, the kidneys would dump more water out in urine. That means that the kidneys have the ability to remove water from the blood and excrete it out in urine. So if you remove water from the blood, your blood volume would go down because you're getting rid of the water, right? If your blood volume goes down, your blood pressure goes down. And by excreting more water out in urine, if you're overhydrated, your urinary output volume would go up because you're excreting more water. So how much water is being excreted in urine is directly related to the volume of water in the blood. Let's face it this way. Let's look at it this way. If you're dehydrated, everybody knows you don't have enough water. You're dehydrated, right? Well, a person that's dehydrated, the kidneys are told in hormonal loops and some other things that you're going to be covering to save water, not to lose water in urine, to put the water back in the blood. So if the kidneys excrete less water out, the urinary output volume would go down and that excess water that we're not excreting out is going back to the blood. So your blood volume would go up. And if your blood volume goes up, your blood pressure goes up. So the kidneys regulate water balance in the blood by either excreting more water out in urine or saving water and putting it back in the blood. By doing that, the kidneys are a major regulator of blood pressure. I mean, you guys remember the renin angiotensin aldosterone system? The kidneys produce renin. I'm going to show you where that's made actually in a minute. And so the renin angiotensin aldosterone system, when it's activated, increases your blood volume and your blood pressure. So not only is the kidney involved in regulating blood pressure because we can manipulate water volume in the blood, but it also produces an enzyme called renin that activates a hormonal system to raise your blood pressure. So the renin angiotensin aldosterone system is a hormonal system that raises your blood pressure. So whenever we get dehydrated, that's one of the systems that is activated in order to help maintain blood pressure. Now, it's not the only hormonal system involved with that, but it is a very important one. It's one of the most important ones in the body. So these are some of the main functions of the kidney. Now, let's look at some of the anatomy of the kidney so we can get into how the kidney is performing its jobs, right? So the kidney is shaped like a kidney bean. It has this indented area in the middle. That's called the hilus. That's where the tubes and the blood vessels and nerves all enter and lead the kidney through the, through the hilus, that indented area. The kidney is surrounded by a dense fibrous connective tissue capsule. 
and just deep to the capsule, at least in the picture you see it's kind of lighter on the outskirts, that's called the renal cortex. It's the cortex of the kidney. Just deep to that, you see some darker areas shaped like a little pyramid. And then in between them, you see these, this tissue that's kind of lighter, it's called a renal column. These little pyramids are called renal pyramids. So all of this is in what we call the medulla, the renal medulla, right? Now, <clears throat> this little yellow tube that you see, you could barely make it out in this little picture. There's a million of these little tubes in each kidney, a million of them. These little tubes are called nephrons. Nephrons are the functional unit of the kidney. These are the structures and the cells that line this tube are the cells that perform the jobs of regulating all of these things that we just, I just went over. The nephrons do that, right? So the way this works is this, this little bitty tip where the pointer on this picture, at least where it says nephron, you see that little, that little circle right there. We're going to see it bigger in a minute. That little circular area is called a renal corpuscle. And inside of it is a special group of capillaries that filters our blood. So everybody knows the kidneys filter your blood. I think everybody knows that. Well, the area where it's specifically filtered would be in that little circle. Now, when the blood is filtered, pretty much everything is filtered out except for your red and white blood cells in your platelets and large proteins, plasma proteins are not filtered out. If they are filtered out, then you're in renal failure. That's not supposed to end up in your urine, right? But pretty much everything else comes out, water, your electrolytes, <clears throat> sugar, glucose, uh, small to very sm medium-sized proteins can be leaked out. A lot of medium-sized proteins aren't even leaked out in, in the filtration process, but pretty much everything is filtered out except all those large components. Now, the reason why I'm telling you that is once we filter the blood right here, the fluid that is formed from filtering the plasma is called filtrate. That's what we call the filtration product in the kidney when it's first filtered. Filtrate has a chemical composition that's almost identical to plasma, except for the fact there's no blood cells, red cells, white cells, or platelets in it, and there's no large plasma proteins in it, right? So the problem there is this. We just filtered out all of our good stuff and we filtered out all the waste products we want to get rid of. So we have a couple other jobs to do. It's not good enough to say, hey, we filtered the waste products out because we're also filtering out our good stuff. Now that filtrate, once it's formed at that, from the glomerulus at the renal corpuscle, that fluid flows through this little squiggly tube. And the path that it takes as it flows through this tube, the chemical composition of the fluid changes because the cells that line the tube have the ability to take anything that is passing through the tube that we need and reabsorb it and put it back in the blood. They also have the ability to take substances from the blood and secrete it directly into the tube. So we have to filter, reabsorb, and secrete. Those are the three processes of urine formation. It'll make a little more sense in a minute. But my point is this, once the fluid reaches the end of this tube at what's called a papillary duct. It's called urine. All through the tube is called filtrate. And then down here, when we stop manipulating its chemical composition, it's called urine. And notice each one of these pyramids has a little tip on it. All the papillary ducts exit or excrete urine out of the tip of a pyramid. The tip of a pyramid is called the renal papilla. 
So the, the tip there is a papilla, that's a papilla, that's a papilla. Just a very tip is called the renal papilla on the whole renal pyramid. And the reason why I'm telling you that is because you're gonna have to identify some areas here that are kind of labeled on the model. And so the very middle of the kidney is open. Urine is flowing through all these open cavities in here as it's draining out of the papillary ducts. So the very first little opening at the tip of a pyramid is called the minor calyx. So you have a minor calyx at the tip of each pyramid. Those are in the, in the diagram are cut open so you can see it's hollow. These, you can see it's more tubular right here. It's not cut open, but it's still hollow in there. That's a minor calyx, that's a minor calyx. Now where the minor calyces join together, you form what's called a major calyx. Then from the major calyx, we have a larger opening towards the hilus of the kidney. That largest opening out of all of these spaces is called the renal pelvis. So urine is flowing out of the papillary duct into a major calyx, into the, I'm sorry, into the minor calyx, into the major calyx, then to the renal pelvis, and then down this tube called the ureter. And this ureter goes all the way to your urinary bladder. It actually connects on the posterior, superior sort of posterior side of the urinary bladder. And so that's how urine is going to your, kid, uh, to your bladder from the kidney. It's flowing ultimately out of this tube into these spaces, right? Now, does anybody have any questions about that? That's pretty much, I'm just describing urine flow right there. All right, well, let's get to the blood flow in the kidney because you're gonna to have to identify the blood vessels in the kidney. So I'm gonna point them out to you and tell you their names. So first of all, arterial blood obviously is gonna enter the kidney through the renal artery. This would connect to the aorta, which is not shown. So arterial blood is gonna come in through the hilus as the renal artery penetrates. Immediately, the renal artery subdivides into these little segments. As soon as the renal artery splits into these little segments, that portion of the artery is called a segmental artery. So you have several of them, segmental arteries. The segmental arteries then course into the kidney and have branches that go up the tissue that is between the renal pyramids. Remember, I just called the, those areas of the tissue the renal column. So the arteries that go up a renal column are called the interlobar artery. So blood comes in the renal artery, goes into a segmental artery, goes up the column in an interlobar artery. Now, the blood is distributed into an artery that courses over the top of each pyramid. So the little, the little red vessels, the arteries, that arch over the top of a pyramid are called arcuate arteries because they're arching over the pyramid, arcuates. Leading from an arcuate artery, the only little red vessel, the little red ar artery that goes perpendicular up into the cortex. So there's one there. There's one there. There's a couple here. All the red ones that go straight up are called cortical radiate arteries. Now from the cortical radiate artery, we can't see it on this picture. I'm gonna have to show you it on another one in a minute. The most important arteriole in the kidney, remember an arteriole is a small artery. The most important arteriole in the kidney receives blood from the cortical radiate artery. And if you look at the, the flow chart here, you can see it. The next little artery would be called an afferent arteriole from the cortical radiate. The afferent arteriole has the job of carrying blood 
into the filter of the kidney where we filter the blood. And it just so happens that the filter in the kidney is, is, a, is a capillary bed and it's called the glomerular capillaries or you could just say the glomerulus. Both are correct. So the blood pressure in this capillary bed is higher than any other capillary bed in the body. And that blood pressure is the main force that drives the filtration of water and solutes across the wall of the capillary bed and, and forms the filtrate. Now, leaving the glomerulus, as the blood moves through these glomerular capillaries, the blood is going to leave the glomerulus through what's called an efferent arteriole. The efferent arteriole, carrying blood out of the renal corpuscle, is going to send the blood into capillary beds. In the cortex, the up here in the cortex, the capillary beds are receiving blood from what's called the efferent arteriole. We can see it on this little picture, by the way. So if we look up here, we see the afferent arteriole right there. This is what's receiving blood from that cortical radiate artery, the one that goes straight up and down through the cortex. So blood goes into the afferent arteriole, which then goes into the glomerular capillary loops right here inside this little circle. The whole circular structure is called the renal corpuscle. So, and this renal corpuscle is attached to this hollow tube. So the blood pressure is forcing fluids and solutes across the capillary wall into this cup. It's called the Bowman's capsule. I'll show you that on a bigger picture. But the blood also is still flowing through the capillaries and leaves the capillary bed into the efferent arteriole right here. The efferent arteriole supplies the blood into two, one of two capillary beds. The capillary bed, and here the artist shows them in purple, the capillary bed that's up in the cortex, which would be out here, is called the peritubular capillary network. But notice we have a capillary bed that's dipping down into the, into the medullary area. The renal pyramid is where those capillary beds would be surrounding the renal tubule down here. That's called a vasa recta. So the blood's going to pass through the peritubular network, the vasa recta, and it's going to end up in a cortical radiate vein. The cortical radiate vein are the little blue vessels that run perpendicular up through the cortex. So all of the little blue vessels that's running up through the cortex are called the cortical radiate veins. The cortical radiate veins, and I'll show you right here, here's one, little blue vessel, is draining blood from the cortex back down to the blue vessel that's arching over the top of a pyramid. That vessel is called the arcuate vein. From the arcuate vein, the blood is going to flow down a blue vessel that runs down the renal column. So that vein that runs down the renal column is called an interlobar vein. From the interlobar vein, the blood is going to go to segmental veins. So those are segmental veins coming out right there, those branches. The segmental veins then end up putting the blood into the renal vein. The renal vein would attach to the inferior vena cava, which is not shown. Now, the reason why we learn the blood flow through the kidney is because it is blood flow directly that drives kidney function. If the, you know, there's some sort of a, a blockage or a problem with the blood flow to the kidney, the kidney is going to malfunction. We're going to cover a, a couple of those examples at the end of today. What happens with blood pressure changes. Now, I should mention this. The kidney has the ability to regulate its own blood pressure. So that if there's 
increases or decreases in systemic blood pressure in your body, the kidney won't be uh, harmed too much from that. They can still function normally because they can either increase or decrease their own pressure. It's called autoregulation. This is a pretty important function of the kidney, right? Because it is blood pressure that drives the kidney function to filter up here. Now through the packet, I did leave in some of these animations that are typically I just have in my lecture PowerPoint, but just in case you wanted to go and view them in the lab, because some people don't have the lecture, you just be connected to the internet and you can view those animations. Same thing with this one, anatomy overview of a nephron animation. So here's the basic anatomy of the nephron, the functional unit of the kidney right here. There's a million of these in each kidney. So you can see it's up here in the kidney as we were just, as I just pointed out, you can't see it too well up there, but they enlarge it so we can see the parts of it. You're going to have to be able to identify the parts of a nephron on the model, right? And so the parts are pretty simple. Some students confuse a part of it, and I'll show you it right here and on the next couple of slides. But let's just start at the beginning. Here's our glomerulus. That's the filter, which is basically a capillary bed. Notice it's housed, the glomerulus that is, is housed in this little C-shaped cup. This circular structure is called the renal corpuscle so that the blood pressure in the glomerulus pushes the fluid and solutes out into the space of the cup. So the outer part of this is called Bowman's capsule or the glomerular capsule because it surrounds the glomerulus. It's connected to the renal tubule. So the nephron is made up of the renal corpuscle and then it's made up of a tube called the renal tubule. The parts of the renal tubule are these. The first part of the renal tubule, that is the part that's connected directly to Bowman's capsule or the glomerular capsule, is called the proximal convoluted tubule right here. So this part that squiggles around, that's attached directly to the renal corpuscle is called the PCT, proximal convoluted tubule. But then notice the tube makes a turn and we have a loop. One part goes down and one part goes up. The older name for this loop is called the loop of Henley. You'll still probably see that name, the loop of Henley. Newer books just reverted to calling it nephron loop. So here's where students confuse some things. They reverse sometimes what's called the descending limb of the nephron loop with the ascending limb of the nephron loop. Because if you just learned it in order as I'm putting it here, but you look at a picture or a model where this thing's flipped over, you would, you would reverse them. And the reason why I'm saying we only have descending and then ascending is because if you look at the arrows, they only go in one direction. The arrows are showing the direction with which the filtrate is flowing. So the filtrate that is being formed from filtering at the glomerulus only flows in one direction through this tube. So I'll always tell students, start identifying the parts of the tube at the area of the renal corpuscle. Because you know the first part of the tube is the proximal convoluted tubule that then would go down, the filtrate would go down this part of the loop. So that would have to be descending, the descending limb of the nephron loop. The next part would be the ascending limb because it goes up. And then we have what's called the distal convoluted tubule, which is abbreviated the DCT, D as in dog, DCT. So you have the PCT, descending and ascending nephron loop and the distal convoluted tubule. Here's a larger view of the renal corpuscle where the first part of kidney function to produce urine occurs. This is the, is the glomerular capillary bed. Now it is surrounded by special cells called podocytes. 
uh, but we're not technically, well, you know, you do have to identify the podocytes on a model. So on the outside of the capillary loops are these special weird looking cells. They help form the outer layer of the filtration membrane. They're called the podocytes. And notice they go around on the loops. The loops are the capillary beds. I mean, the capillary loops being surrounded by these podocytes. So blood would come in through the afferent arteriole right here into the capillary loops under high pressure. That high pressure forces fluid and solutes out into this capsular space, just on the inside of what's called Bowman's capsule or the glomerular capsule. The filtrate, the fluid that's formed is called the filtrate. It then flows into the proximal convoluted tubule and notice we have these cuboidal cells that line the proximal tube. Now, the majority of the cells that make up the lining of this tube are cuboidal in nature. But we do have a couple of places where the epithelium does change. We're not covering that, right? But you can at least see these are the cuboidal cells of the proximal convoluted tubule right here. These are the cells that have the job of taking anything that's good in the fluid flowing by them that we need and they reabsorb it through their membranes and put it back into a blood vessel that would lie out here. That's called tubular reabsorption. So we can reabsorb all, all of our good stuff back into the blood that we're filtering out. Now, blood's gonna leave the glomerulus via the efferent arteriole right here and then go into those capillary beds, the peritubular network in the cortex or the vasa recta in the medulla. But notice we have another structure here. This is another part of the renal tubule. In fact, it's this part right here where it bends, where the ascending limb of the nephron loop is bending to form the distal tube. That little bend right there cut in cross section actually physically touches the afferent arteriole. This is that part of the renal tubule. This is the ascending loop of the, the ascending limb of the nephron loop. It physically touches the afferent arteriole during development of the fetal, of the kidney and the fetus and the baby in utero. And when that tube is developing and touches the afferent arteriole, the cells become specialized. So all of the cells that are lining the tube become specialized, called the macula densa. You have to be able to identify them, the macula densa cells. And then the smooth muscle cells in the wall of the afferent arteriole at this vicinity become special. They're called the juxtaglomerular cells which are also abbreviated JG cells. And these are the cells that produce renin. Renin will be produced when our blood pressure is low or our blood volume is low. Renin gets into the blood and activates the renin angiotensin aldosterone system. That system increases our blood pressure. So this is why one major reason why the, the kidneys, out of the two major reasons why the kidneys are involved in regulating blood pressure, because the JG cells can secrete renin to activate the renin angiotensin aldosterone system, which increases our blood pressure. So that's what the JG cells do. They produce renin. The macula densa cells on this side of the of the renal tubule, the ascending limb, this side that physically touches the afferent arteriole, these cells become crowded and they look like small columnar cells really more than anything. And they're called the macula densa. They actually have the job of monitoring how much sodium chloride is in the filtrate by the time the filtrate is passing this part of the tube. So let me pull this picture up again. Remember the filtrates moving through this tube. 
all along the length of this tube as the filtrate is moving through it. The tubule cells have special transporters that can transport substances from the tube, the filtrate, into a blood vessel on the outside of it, basically called reabsorption. So we're supposed to reabsorb a certain amount of salt through the tube by the time the filtrate reaches that spot. If there's too much sodium chloride in the filtrate by the time it reaches this spot, that's bad. And it tells the kidney something. And if there's too little sodium chloride in the filtrate by the time it reaches that spot, which the macula densa cells are detecting, then it tells the kidney something. And basically adjusts blood pressure. And we're going to... You're going to look at that and learn that in lecture, the, the actual feedback loops to control that blood pressure changes. We can alter the blood pressure in the glomerulus to either increase it or decrease it. And if for some reason you have too much, too much sodium chloride in the filtrate by the time it reaches this part of the tube, that means the filtrate is moving through the tube too quickly and the cells don't have enough time to reabsorb the salt back into the blood. And what controls directly the rate at which filtrate moves through the tube is how fast you filter. How fast are we filtering? Are we filtering too quickly? In which case the filtrate moves too quickly and we have too much salt in the tube by the time the macula densa detects it? And if so, we have to slow down filtration rate. We have to slow it down. Well, one very quick, easy way we increase or decrease filtration rate is by increasing or decreasing blood pressure in the glomerulus. If you increase the pressure in the glomerulus, you increase filtration rate. If you decrease the blood pressure in the glomerulus, you slow down or decrease the filtration rate. Did I say that right? If you increase pressure, you increase filtration rate. If you decrease blood pressure, you decrease filtration rate. And the rate at which we filter directly controls how fast the filtrate is moving. So that's what the macula densa does. It basically keeps an eye on, hey, how fast are we filtering? By actually monitoring the salt concentration in the filtrate. So again, if we have too much salt, sodium chloride, that means the filtrate's moving too fast and we have to slow down filtration rate by decreasing blood pressure. If we have too much, uh, not enough salt, sodium chloride in the filtrate, that means we're filtering too slowly and the filtrate's moving through the tube too slowly and the cells have too much time to reabsorb too much salt. And by the time it gets here, there's not enough sodium chloride in the filtrate. So that is a signal to, hey, we need to increase the filtration rate by increasing blood pressure. So that's what these cells are doing. We're going to be identifying, there's a, one model that shows the renal corpuscle. You're going to identify the afferenteriole, the efferenteriole, the podocytes, the Bowman's capsule or glomerular capsule, the proximal tube, the cuboidal cells of the proximal tube, the juxtaglomerular cells of the afferenteriole and the macula densa of the ascending limb of the loop of Henle. You're gonna see all this on a model when you go to review it. Now we have two basic types of nephrons in the kidney. However, they pretty much do the same thing. There is a slight difference I'm not covering in here, but they still perform the same three basic processes in order to produce urine. All nephrons have to filter the blood. That's called glomerular filtration. And then the filtrate flows through the tube, the proximal tube here, the descending limb of the nephron loop, the ascending limb of the nephron loop, the distal convoluted tubule. And then it goes into what we call the collecting duct system. And then down into what's called the papillary duct. And here you see the little exit points from all the little papillary ducts in the tip of a renal pyramid 
called the renal papilla. And this goes into the minor calyx right here, the open space below the pyramid. So if you look at this picture, this picture is a picture of what's called a cortical nephron. It's called a cortical nephron because the renal corpuscle is higher up in the cortex. Here's the renal capsule up here, the outer part of the kidney. So this is all the cortex. Below this cortical medullary line, as it's called, or junction, down here is the renal medulla. So the majority of all of the nephrons in each kidney are this type, about 85% of all of them. And since you have a million nephrons in the kidney, that means 850,000 of them are cortical nephrons. So it's a cortical nephron because the renal corpuscle is higher in the cortex. And it also has a very short loop of Henle or nephron loop, very short loop relative to this one. I know it looks the same, but this one has a long loop. And these loops can dip almost all the way down to the renal papilla of the renal pyramid. So they go further down into the medulla, the renal medulla in the pyramid. Their renal corpuscle also lies closer to what's called the cortical medullary junction or line. And for that reason, this nephron is called a juxta medullary nephron. The prefix juxta means adjacent to. So the renal corpuscle is adjacent to the cortical medullary junction, right? So you still have to identify the parts. We have our glomerulus in the renal corpuscle, the proximal convoluted tubule, the descending nephron loop, the ascending nephron loop, and then the distal convoluted tubule over here that goes into what we call the co collecting duct system, and then into the papillary duct that's down towards the renal papilla of the renal pyramid, right? Now, when you go to review the model in Quizlet, there's, in the model, they show one side has a juxtamedullary nephron, the other side has a cortical nephron. So I shortened the names up a little bit. You can write the shortened names on the practical. I know all the names, but for instance, instead of saying uh, the cortical, no, instead of saying, the descending limb of the nephron loop of a cortical nephron. Instead of saying all of that, you can shorten it and say the descending cortical nephron loop or the ascending cortical nephron loop. Same thing on this one. This would be the descending juxtamedullary nephron loop or the ascending juxtamedullary nephron loop. You'll see those names on the Quizlet. I have them all labeled, all right? So those are the parts of the nephron. Now, what about the physiology that I've been mentioning? Well, this picture makes it a little bit easier. Of course, you're not identifying this picture on, on the test, but I like to use it to describe the physiological processes for urine production and thus the maintenance of and regulation of all aspects of the blood happens in from this picture. So what you're looking at is a simple diagram of a nephron, the renal corpuscle with the glomerulus in the middle and the renal tubule. We have the proximal tube, we would have the nephron loop and we would have the distal tube. Of course, it's just a straight line right here, but at any rate, we have blood coming in from our afferent arteriole into the glomerulus, which is the filter in, in the renal corpuscle. The increased blood pressure in here causes filtration to occur, forming the filtrate that flows in one direction through the tube. The blood as it's passing through also leaves the glomerulus via the efferent arteriole, which supplies the blood into one of two capillary networks. If it's in the cortex, it's called the peritubular capillary network. In the medulla, 
It's called the Vasa recta. So here are the capillary beds called the Vasa recta that go around the nephron loop. That's the Vasa recta. All the red and blue vessels connected together is called the Vasa recta. All of the capillary loops that surround the renal tubules up in the cortex is called the peritubular capillary network right here. Also, I, I should point this out off of this picture. Here's the cortical medullary line. You know what that really means? That's the very top of a pyramid, the top of one of these renal pyramids right there, that line. So just above that is cortex, right? So what are the vessels that arch over the top of a pyramid? But nothing more than the arcuate vessels. The red one is the arcuate artery. The blue one is the arcuate vein arching over the top of a pyramid. Now, the reason why I'm pointing this out is this. Students often confuse identifying the afferent arteriole and the efferent arteriole on the model or in a picture like this. And I'm gonna tell you an easy way to remember it. And this is why you learn the blood flow in order. Blood is gonna come up a renal column in an interlobar artery then into this arcuate artery that arches over the top of a pyramid. So they don't show the interlobar, but they show a piece of the arcuate artery. From the arcuate artery, blood's going to go up the only artery that goes perpendicular up through the cortex. That's called the cortical radiate artery. Notice the only branch that comes off of the cortical radiate artery, the afferent arteriole. The afferent arteriole is always the arteriole that has a connection to the uh, cortical radiate artery. Notice the efferent arteriole coming back out of the glomerulus in the capsule here. It never, ever, ever touches or makes contact with the cortical radiate artery. You see how it comes out and it branches and forms this capillary bed? and then it goes down in the medulla and forms this capillary bed, that's the efferent arteriole coming out. It's not connected to the art cortical radiate artery. Only the afferent arteriole is. So let's look at the processes here. First, we have to filter the blood. That's called glomerular filtration. We have pretty much everything in plasma is filtered out except for your blood cells, red, white cells, and platelets, and large proteins. Even many medium-sized proteins aren't filtered out, but small proteins can come out. Amino acids, vitamins, electrolytes, sugar, water, all that is filtered out. Waste products come out as well, right? So the cells that line this tube all the way around the tube have the last two jobs to perform before urine is produced. So first we filter, then the movement of the filtrate through the tube, the cells that line the tube have to reclaim any good stuff that we filtered out and put it back into the blood. That's called tubular reabsorption. That way we don't lose wanted substances out in urine all the time. We can put it back in the blood vessels of the peritubular capillary network or the vasa recta for that matter. We can put it back in the blood where it came from if we filtered it out, put it back. But we have one other job to perform. The blood's being filtered at the glomerulus, but it's also leaving. It's just, it never stops to be filtered, it's flowing. So sometimes blood is exiting the filter, the glomerulus in the efferent arteriole, and there's some substances that we really still wanna get rid of, excess substances in the blood, waste products. So we have a second chance of getting rid of it. If it bypasses the filter, and it's flowing in the blood in the capillaries, it can be secreted directly into the tube to be lost in urine. That's called tubular secretion. All right, um, here's the renal corpuscle again. I'm not gonna go back over that. Here they, they talk a little bit about what I was mentioning before, if we are filtering too quickly or too slowly. There's a homeostatic reflex loop where the kidney can maintain 
a constant rate of filtration by adjusting its own blood pressure. So uh, you can read a little bit on that in our Engage manual. There's not a whole lot on that that you're going to be covering. But like I said, if the filtration rate is too high, you're going to lose substances in urine. You don't have enough time to reabsorb it. So you're going to have to slow it down. The way you slow GFR, which is glomerular filtration rate, the way you slow that down is by decreasing blood pressure in the glomerulus. On the other hand, you could be filtering too slowly, in which case you're reabsorbing almost everything, including waste products. You're not adequately getting rid of the waste that we need because the, the filtrate's moving too slow. So what do you have to do? You have to speed up the rate at which you filter. How do you do that? you increase the blood pressure in the glomerulus. So we have several forces that we learned about um, back in, at least in your lecture, back in the chapter 21, you learned about net filtration pressure. Net filtration pressure is a pressure that's calculated based on some forces that govern all capillary beds in the body. There's four basic forces that govern all capillary beds. And in the glomerulus in the kidney, we can basically sum it down to three forces. The blood pressure in the glomerulus directly, which is called glomerular blood hydrostatic pressure. That's a fancy way of saying blood pressure in the glomerulus glomerular blood hydrostatic pressure, we, which is a, for, a pushing force trying to push the fluid and solutes out. But we also have a buildup of fluid in the capsule, in the capsular space, that's pushing back against the capillaries. That's called the capsular hydrostatic pressure. We then also have a force that tries to pull fluid back into the blood that force is actually inside the blood vessel itself and it's called the blood colloid osmotic pressure. That's a pulling force. It's trying to pull solutes and fluid back in from within itself. It's called an osmotic pressure. So in order to calculate whether or not you're gonna filter or reabsorb in a capillary bed, you have to uh, calculate what's called the net filtration pressure. Well, in the glomerulus, the net filtration pressure equals the glomerular blood hydrostatic pressure. You have to subtract from that the blood colloid osmotic pressure and subtract from that the capsular hydrostatic pressure or in whichever order. Basically, you subtract these two values from this first one. And notice the pressure is, the units are millimeters of mercury of pressure. Now this, this pressure, this blood pressure right here is very, very high for a capillary bed. That's because the glomerular capillary bed is specialized. I don't have time to go into the specializations right now, but it's, su it's sufficient to say that the blood pressure in here is higher than any other capillary bed in the body. And that high pressure in the capillary bed helps only promote filtration. You see this capillary bed for one reason is specialized because you have an arterial feed and an arterial drain, but it's also specialized because we have all these capillary loops are very long. And so what we have here, we only have filtration. We never have reabsorption back in like other capillary beds in the body. The reason for that is because of this high pressure right here. So on the physiology test, you're gonna to have to know the formula, the net filtration formula for glomerular filtration. And basically in FP, net filtration pressure equals the glomerular blood hydrostatic pressure minus the capsular hydrostatic pressure minus the blood colloid osmotic pressure. And in this example, you end up with a positive 10 millimeters of mercury of pressure. So if the net filtration pressure is a positive number after you do your calculation and in other capillary beds as well, if the net filtration pressure is a positive value, then you always are filtering. If you do this calculation, not in this capillary bed, but other capillary beds in the body, you could end up with a negative number. 
And if you end up with a negative number, that means you're reabsorbing back into the capillary. <clears throat> now, we don't want that to happen here. You only ever want to filter. And that's why this pressure is so high, right? In other capillary beds, it's like 36, and then it drops to the venual drain side of a capillary bed to 16. So this is very high for a capillary bed. All right, the last few things that I want to cover <clears throat> deal with some ion channel, I'm not ion channels, but some transporters in the cell. Um, you're not identifying the transporters, but I want you to know what the transporters are doing. The transporters are embedded in the membranes of the cuboidal cells that line the renal tubule. So there are sodium potassium pumps everywhere. You guys remember that from general biology, maybe? This, these types of pumps are active transporters that actually use ATP. They're called a primary active transporter. So these pumps always have to use ATP to make sure that the sodium concentration on the inside of the tubule cell is always low. So I don't have a picture to show you, but I'll, show, I'll describe how it works off of a picture in a second. But these pumps have to always work to maintain a low concentration of sodium on the inside of the cell. And for that reason, the sodium electrochemical gradient that is set up by these pumps drives the actions of the secondary active transporters called symporters and antiporters. Symporter and antiporter is a generic name. Symporters are transporters that move two or more substances in the same direction across the membrane. Antiporters are transporters that move two or more substances in opposite directions across the membrane. So we're going to look at some symporters and antiporters and where they're located. So here we have a sodium glucose symporter. They're going to be found in the proximal convoluted tubule the first part of the tube. And we also have sodium hydrogen antiporters. So the symporter means that sodium and, and glucose, the sugar, will move in the same direction. In the antiporter, the sodium and the hydrogen move in opposite directions, right? Now these are found in the PCT. I want you to know that. That's gonna be important in a minute when I describe uh, abnormalities of urine. We also have water channels in the membrane of the PCT. And the water channels are called aquaporins. We have two basic ones. Aquaporin ones are in the PCT. And you also have something called aquaporin twos. They're located in the DCT in the collecting duct, but we're not going to get into that in here. You're going to do that in lecture. So basically, they allow water to move across the membrane more freely. That's called a water channel, the aquaporin. So let's look at how these transporters are actually going to work. Oh, good. They do have the, the sodium. Uh, pump on here. So ultimately, if you remember, if you open a sodium channel, sodium always wants to flow into a cell down its concentration gradient. So these are not simple ion channels. They are transporters, but I just use that as an analogy. So when these transporters are working, the sodium glucose symporter, it allows sodium to come in and glucose can piggyback a ride in with it. So out here is the middle of the renal tubule where the filtrate is flowing. We just filtered out all of our glucose. Of course, you, everybody knows glucose in your urine is abnormal. So since we're filtering our glucose out, we have to be able to reabsorb it. All of your glucose, all of it, has to be reabsorbed in the proximal convoluted tubule because you don't have these glucose transporters anywhere else in the nephron only in the proximal convoluted tubule. So if someone has uncontrolled diabetes mellitus, they would have high blood sugar, right? Hyperglycemia. If someone has a blood sugar that's above 160 milligrams per deciliter and up towards 200, that is too much sugar being filtered out to be transported by the transporters. These transporters can only work so fast. 
And if you have too much sugar out here, some sugar is going to be transported, but other sugar is going to bypass the transporter. And once the sugar is past the proximal convoluted tubule and it's in the loop of Henle or the, descent, the distal tube and all the rest of the tube, sugar is destined to end up in urine. So that's one reason how we would be able to tell if someone has uncontrolled diabetes mellitus by doing a urinalysis. If you have sugar in your urine, one major reason for that is diabetes mellitus, uncontrolled. So this is a sim porter. Now, this sim porter only works if sodium concentration is maintained low in here. If the concentration went up, sodium wouldn't want to come in. So what keeps the low sodium concentration in here? Well, the pump. The sodium potassium pumps use ATP to actively kick sodium back out of the cell up its concentration gradient. So this is the sodium glucose importer. But we also have, oh, and I put here if it's too high, the 200 milligrams in the blood, if it's too high, uh, then sugar is going to end up in your urine. And if you have sugar in your urine, it's called glucosuria, by the way. I'm glad I saw that slide. I forgot to tell you that. So... That typically comes from uncontrolled diabetes mellitus. You have too much sugar in the blood, it's filtered out, and you override the transporters that have the ability to put it back in, into the blood. That's why you can't have high, high blood sugar. You're gonna lose some in your urine, right? And people with diabetes, since they have all this sugar in the filtrate, it causes more water to be lost. Water's gonna go to the concentrated fluid so people who are diabetic, uncontrolled, they go to the bathroom all the time. They have a high urinary output volume and they're constantly thirsty because they're dumping all their water out in urine. The water's following the sodium out. I mean, the glucose out. Now, we also have another transporter that's important. I want you to know the name of. It's called the sodium hydrogen antiporter. So we're going to talk about this a little more next week. When we do acid base balance, but I need to show you the picture now. I don't know if I have a picture next week, but the sodium hydrogen antiporter moves sodium, which will always go in, into the cell. But at the same time, it's transporting hydrogen out into the filtrate. Remember, hydrogen is acid. So we have the ability to excrete acid by performing this carbonic acid equation. We're going to learn that again next week if you, if you didn't learn it or you forgot it. But carbon dioxide and water combine together in the presence of carbonic anhydrase, this enzyme, to produce carbonic acid, H2CO3. I know you can't read that, but that's H2CO3. And H2CO3 splits up into hydrogen, which is excreted out and ultimately can become part of urine. And then bicarbonate. HCO3 minus. This is one of the major buffers in our blood. So our, our cells can excrete acid out and reabsorb buffer to buffer the blood. This is one way out of a couple of ways. I'm about to show you the other one on how our blood pH can be regulated at the organ level with the kidney because we can directly manipulate acid secretion or excretion and buffer reabsorption. The other cells uh, that are important here are principal cells. Principal cells are found in the collecting ducts and in the, in the, really in the distal portion of the distal convoluted tubule and the collecting duct. And these cells are, have receptors for aldosterone. If you remember aldosterone. So aldosterone tells these cells basically to reabsorb sodium back into the blood, but to kick out potassium. So aldosterone causes more potassium to be dumped out in urine, but more sodium to be reabsorbed. Now, why is that important? Well, in the renin angiotensin aldosterone system, it's gonna try and increase your blood pressure. So one way that we can increase our blood pressure is by increasing our water volume in the blood, increase your blood volume. Well, 
Aldosterone tells the kidney to reabsorb salt, sodium here, and indirectly, it would cause for more water to be reabsorbed, even though they don't show it. Water always follows this sodium. Wherever sodium goes, water is sure to follow. Don't forget that statement. So aldosterone tells the kidney, hey, let's reabsorb more salt, which then reabs reabsorbs more water. And so we would increase our blood volume, which would increase your blood pressure. Now the last cell type has our last transporter in it. That's important. And we're gonna obviously be dealing more with this. I might even pull this picture back up next week. But in the collecting duct again, we have, I'm sorry, I said intercalated cells earlier. I meant principal cells are resp respond to aldosterone. I gotta correct that in the video. If I did say that. Principal cells respond to aldosterone to reabsorb salt and water. Intercalated cells have active transporters that can pump hydrogen, which is acid, up its concentration gradient. About a thousand fold, by the way. That's a lot. So these are the cells that really highly concentrate acid into what will become urine. In the same mechanism with the carbonic acid cycle that we see here. And again, that we're going to cover this next week, the cycle, this equation again. But look what happens. If our blood is too acidic, we can perform this chemical reaction faster and excrete a lot of hydrogen, which is acid out. So it would make your urine more acidic, but it would make your blood more alkaline. It would raise your blood pH back to normal because of this transporter. It's called an exchanger, really. An antiporter can also be called an exchanger. This is the bicarbonate chloride exchanger or the chloride bicarbonate antiporter. It's found on the intercalated cells in the collecting duct in the renal tubules system. So as we are making bicarbonate, we can reabsorb it into the blood, but we have to exchange a bicarbonate for a chloride. The similar thing happens in respiratory physiology. If you remember the chloride shift, in fact, this is the same transporter. We also have this transporter in uh, cells that line our stomach, our gastric lining and our gastric glands and our gastric pit. We have these transporters, all right? Because you, Stomach acid is hydrochloric acid. This is the same system that makes hydrochloric acid in your stomach. This exchanger reabsorbed by carbonate and we allow chloride to come into the cell and then the cell would in, chloride would enter the lumen of the stomach, even though this is not the stomach. And then we excrete hydrogen that would make hydrochloric acid. We don't do that here though. We're not making hydrochloric acid here. So the acid then goes into the filtrate and it makes the urine acidic and it raises the pH of your blood. Now, I left this table in here. Um, you might wanna review it. It has some really good information in it. Talks about the hormones that are important for kidney function um, and their effects, right? Mechanisms of modes of action, sites of action and their effects. This will definitely help you with lecture as well. All right, so that's the end of that packet. Um, I'm gonna stop sharing my screen for a minute. I'm gonna be uploading that PowerPoint after class today to our uh, to our Canvas site, all right? All right, now, I know your brains are probably burned right now, but we have a couple other things that we have to do and then we'll be done. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to share my screen again and show you the Engage Lab Manual. So here it is. I have it pulled up already. So you need to go in. If you had the paper book or you'll read it online, you need to read through all of this. It's only a couple of pages of, of notes on uh, the, the urinary system and its physiological function, right? Up here, they have the basic functions of, and I'm glad I pulled it up because I forgot to tell you this one, the basic functions of the kidney. So besides controlling the balance of everything, water, 
in your blood, electrolytes, acid base balance, all of that in the blood. Your kidneys can also make sugar for you, just like your liver can. So when we make a sugar from a non-sugar, it's called gluconeogenesis. So a little bit of sugar actually can be made by your kidney. The same thing can happen in special chemical reactions happen in our liver. And then they talk about the hormonal systems down here that I mentioned earlier. So you need to read through these paragraphs, jot down some notes. It's only two, about two pages of material and it has information in it that we already covered. All, you know, the collecting ducts, the major and minor calyces, all of that is in there. Glomerular filtration, net filtration formula that I talked about. Tubular reabsorption and secretion. What happens in those tubes? What are the transporters, symporters, and antiporters, right? And the various hormones that can affect it. So read through there. The last thing, and this is all the anatomy that you're going to be identifying on the models. The last thing that I want to bring up in your chapter is your analysis. I want you to know the normal electrolytes that are found in urine. Urea, sodium, potassium. They're in the order of concentration, by the way, from highest to lowest in concentration. Um, on here, the only thing that I'm really going to be focusing on is pH. I'm not going to deal with the color, the odor. The These are the, the physical characteristics and chemical characteristics of urine. We're going to be more concerned with pH. The pH range of urine is fairly wide. It can be acidic or it can be alkaline. It depends on what the pH of our blood is. If our pH of our blood is acidic, if you're in some sort of an acidosis state and your kidneys are functioning normally, then you would want to excrete more acid away from the blood into urine. That would be a normal response. Get rid of the acid out of the blood and put it in the urine. In that case, your urine is going to be more acidic and it brings your blood pH back to normal, more alkaline. On the other hand, if someone is in an alkalosis state where the, their pH is too high, they don't want to excrete acid out in urine. They, they, and if it's very severe, they want to actually reabsorb some acid back to the blood, right? And excrete buffers. So if, if we're telling the kidney cells, in particular, those intercalated cells I just showed you, to that, that, tra that transporter can reverse. We can reabsorb the acid back into the blood and secrete the bicarbonate out. And by removing acid from urine and excreting out a buffer, your pH of your urine can be high. It can be alkaline. So it all depends on the pH of our blood. So this is the one that we're going to be concerned with. All right. So it will be an inverse. So if blood pH is high. Yeah, let me, in fact, since you said that, let me show you, let me, let me stop sharing for a second and pull up the PowerPoint one more time. Let me show you this cell right here. All right, here's our intercalated cell. All right, so we have these active transporters that can just excrete acid, which in the form of hydrogen ion, out in urine, right? Even though it, it doesn't show you, you're technically, when you excrete hydrogen out in urine, you're removing it from the blood. So if someone has a low pH in their blood, they have too much acid in the blood, these cells perform this reaction over and over and over to excrete more acid out in urine. That would make the urine acidic, right? At the same time though, we're excreting more acid out, the urine becomes acidic, we're reabsorbing buffer in the form of bicarbonate. So the bicarbonate would come into the blood and, and buffer, basically bind to the acid that's in the blood. And that would raise our blood pH back to normal. Now, in someone that is in an extreme alkalosis state, this would be very extreme. The movements of hydrogen out and the movement of bicarbonate in can be reversed. That's exactly right, whoever just said that. But that's only in very extreme cases. 
So let's say someone is very, very, very alkaline. And who remembers blood pH range anyway? Anybody? 7.35 to 7.45. So when I say extreme alkalosis, that would be above 7.45 is alkalosis. Below 7.35 is acidosis. So if someone has a blood pH of 7.58 to 7.6, they're you're almost dead. We can't have wide pH changes in our blood that much. People can go into convulsions and all sorts of things. We're going to cover that next week. But if the pH is very, very, very high, obviously you don't want to keep reabsorbing buffer because you would keep buffering the acid in the blood and that would make the pH go up even more, right? So one way that the kidneys can help combat that is to reverse these movements of these two ions you actually can flip and take this hydrogen and kick it out the back end and put it back in the blood, even though they don't show it. And you could take this bicarbonate, instead of it going out into the blood, it could be kicked out into urine. You would just reverse these two mechanisms in extreme alkalosis because you don't have enough acid in the blood when you're in alkalosis. So that's an extreme case. You could reabsorb acid to the blood and you could secrete buffer out to urine. And that is what would change. That's why urine has such a wide pH range in a normal range. 4.5, very acidic. 8.0, very basic, very alkaline. The average is around six though, all right? So we're about to deal with that. Now, so out of this, I'm just really worried about the pH. The next section talks about abnormalities in the urine. I don't want to go through and just read all of these off. I'm going, to, I'm going to pick out a couple of them. Everybody's heard of kidney stones. Read through this. Learn what some of these inflammatory responses are, right? Um, but I do want to talk about glucose. Glucose is not supposed to be in your urine at all. That's abnormal with any glucose in your urine. If glucose ends up in your urine, it's because someone is hyperglycemic. Our normal glucose range should be around 100 would be the average, but it can range from 80 to 120 and even up to 140 to right, right around 140 and above would not cause that bad of a problem if it's controlled. Like if it spikes up real quick, but then your body corrects it, you're okay. It's the people that have uncontrolled diabetes mellitus, which can be attributed to hormonal imbalances like insulin. Everybody knows that, right? So if the body is unresponsive to insulin, which can happen because, or the body does not make insulin, then we cannot absorb glucose from the blood to our body cells, at least most tissues. So where does all that sugar end up? It ends up being filtered out. So if you're above 160, up to 200, that sugar is going to end up in the urine. And that's abnormal. Now, albumin is a large protein. Albumin is one of the plasma proteins. When this ends up in our urine, that's bad. That could be due to some physiological trauma or abnormality going on in the body. People are breaking down uh, too much protein, have uh, extreme have an extreme amount of protein intake. So you can see here a couple of those examples that go on. Or in a pathologic state where someone has physical trauma, where they get kicked or punched, or their own body attacks the kidney. Anything that can disrupt the filtration membrane at the glomerulus, we can lose our albumin. Or if there's just way too much protein in the blood, is can pass the filter. That's all abnormal. So those look, a little bit of protein in the urine is normal, but albumin is not. That's a large protein. So that's called albuminuria. And notice I said glucosuria earlier. Urea on the end is attributing that whatever the prefix is, is in the urine, if that makes sense. Now, the other one I want to point out 
is this one, ketone bodies. How many people have heard of ketone ketones before? How many people have heard of a keto diet? Yeah, I've heard of it. Yep. Okay. And so let me just explain a little bit about this and why people on keto diets lose weight. On a keto diet, which is a fancy word, slang term over the last few years for a low carb diet, low sugar diet, sugar busters, if you remember that, if you're as old as I am back in the day, um, diets, South Beach diet, remember you couldn't have sugar. Well, if you don't consume sugar, your body changes how it handles the fuel sources to make ATP. The fuel sources are sugar, fats, and proteins in our body. So if you don't consume sugar or you consume very, very little of it in your diet, you basically are on a low carb diet, which is called a keto diet. So what does that do? Well, by changing your diet, you actually change hormone levels in your body that manipulate sugar, fat, and protein balance and usage. One of them is insulin. So without consuming sugar, you're, you decrease your insulin production. And insulin production actually is one of its roles is to take sugar and save it in adipose tissue and make fat from it. So we decrease insulin production, but we increase glucagon from the liver, uh, from the liver production, affects the liver. Glu I mean, from the pancreas, affects the liver and affects adipose tissue. In the liver, glucagon tell, tells the liver, glucagon tells the liver to make sugar, gluconeogenesis. So your liver is going to make you a little bit of sugar, even though you don't eat it. However, we also increase human growth hormone in the absence of sugar. And human growth hormone is what's going to cause the body to flip how it uses the fuel sources. So the little bit of sugar that the liver is going to make, and the kidney can make some, is going to be saved for the brain. It's called the sugar sparing effect. But all of the other cells in the body that have the ability to utilize fat to make ATP are going to be told, don't use the sugar, the little bit of sugar that's there, we need it for the brain, use the fat. So glucagon and, and human growth hormone are going to make your adipocytes burn fat, triglycerides, and dump those components in the blood. Now, some of the components of a broken down lipid are called ketones. They come from the fatty acids, if you remember fatty acids. Fatty acids begin to be clipped into little bitty sections by enzymes through what's called beta oxidation. You're not gonna remember that, but little bitty clippings of the fatty acid, some of them are called ketones. So basically, when you break down fat, you're releasing the fatty acids and the glycerol, but the fatty acids are broken down into some structures or molecules called ketones. The ketones are the three main ones, acetoacetic acid, that's a ketone, acetone, the females probably know that as a fingernail polish remover if they still use that. And then beta hydroxybutyric acid. That's kind of a long word there. So acetoacetic acid, acetone, and beta hydroxybutyric acid. These are the ketones. So what are ketones used for anyway? And why do they cause a problem in certain people? Well, without going back through aerobic respiration, when our cells are burning fat to make ATP, basically using the ketones, the ketones go directly into the mitochondria to enter the Krebs cycle. And if the cells, if we have more ketones in the blood than the cells have to use to make ATP, if they don't need that many to make ATP, the ketones back up in the blood. It would be like you going to the gas station and filling up your car and leaving the pump run even after the gas tank is full. Where's the gas going to go? It's going to flow out of the truck, out of your car, onto the ground. 
Well, ketones can back up into the blood if, you're, if there's too many of them for your cells to use. When ketones back up into the blood, it makes your blood acidic. Look at these names, acetoacetic acid, beta hydroxybutyric acid. These are acidic compounds. So as, they, as, as someone is burning too much fat too quickly, the ketones build up in the blood and it induces what's called ketoacidosis, a lowering of the blood pH due to a buildup of ketones in the blood. Now, people with uncontrolled diabetes 1, diabetes mellitus 1, I don't know if you ever, if you know somebody with it, they typically are kind of skinny because in diabetes one, they don't make any insulin. They have to take that, that insulin shot. <clears throat> well, in someone that is not very controlled, very good, their body is, can't use any sugar at all. There's no insulin. So what do their body cells have to use? Fat. So they burn so much fat so quickly that the ketones build up in their blood and they go into a diabetic coma from ketoacidosis. And those diabetics, if you, if, if it's there in that severe of a state, their breath would smell fruity, like fruit. Because those ketones, they have a fruity smell to them. So that's the deal with ketones, right? And the keto, and the keto diet. You want in the keto diet, you don't want to eat sugar. You want your body to burn the fat. And then the ketones are going to build up in the blood. And that's when they go to ketosis. Ketosis is where ATP is being driven by the ketone solely in the mitochondria. It's called ketosis. All right. So that's ketones and in, in bodies. We don't, we don't want them in the, in the urine. You don't want these in the urine either. You have this in the urine. That's bad. That's called ketonuria right here. So read through these little paragraphs. I want you to know a little bit about what you see here, all right? Um, acidic urine, basic urine, read that. We're gonna talk more about that next week. You're not supposed to have red blood cells in your urine. That's always bad. Damage to the glomerulus, someone's in renal failure. In fact, we have to talk about, uh, I think we talk about that one. Um, that's called hematuria, Hem hemoglobin in the urine, hemoglobinuria, also abnormal. All right. So just read through those things. Now, the last thing that I want to do is go over briefly, not the answers, but briefly explain a little bit about these case studies at the back of your chapter. And then I'm going to pull up the actual assignment and teach you how to read the urinalysis strip. And then I want you guys to try and do that today. All right. It's, it's free credit. It's free points. As long as you do it, you get the full credit for it, right? So ultimately, I'm sure you guys heard of urinalysis before. Any urinalysis, you could test for many, many <clears throat> different things. We're going to be concerned with these four things on our assignment. The pH of urine, the protein concentration in urine, the glucose concentration, ketones, all of that, all right? So we, ha we have to look at what is normal or a control urine sample in order to know what is abnormal. So this is just showing uh, a little bit about uh, the very first, which would be a control in the lab. If we were in lab, I would give you um, a normal urine sample. We would, we would um, run a, a urinalysis strip on it and then see that if pH is normal, protein is negative, glucose is negative, and ketone is negative. Because you're not supposed to have any of this in the blood, in the urine, right? So on the case studies, you always have a little thing up here, like this is a 82-year-old woman. She has rheumatoid arthritis. Uh, she was hurting real bad. She overtook aspirin, whole bunch of aspirin. Aspirin is actually an acid. It's acetyl salicylic acid. That's what aspirin is. If someone overconsumes aspirin, it can make their blood pH become acidic because you just consumed all that acid going in the blood. So for instance, just to give you th this one away a little bit, if I did a urinalysis on this patient and then did the dipstick on it, 
I probably would see the pH is lower than normal because they just overconsumed aspirin and all the acids in the blood. That would be called the metabolic acidosis. We're going to cover that next week. But then, okay, so this is, this is how you would fill it out. For the pH, you would put high or low or normal or acidic or basic, something like that. You don't have to write a real number down. If, if, it's, if it's below normal, you can even just put below normal or just put acidic. Or if it's normal, you would put normal. Or if it's basic, you would just put basic. And protein, glucose, and ketones, all of these are supposed to be absent. If you have any of them in your urine, you would write positive, high, positive, high, positive, high, because they're not supposed to be there. Or you would put, if they're not there, you would put negative and normal, negative and normal negative and normal. You're not writing the specific numbers. Is everybody with me? All right, now, so I hope you guys can still hear me, but ultimately this assignment, these case studies that's in your book and your lab manual have been digitized with, um, I didn't have to do that. I, oh yeah, I do. have been digitized in our assignments. So I loaded this last night. Can everybody see our Canvas site? Yes. yes. Very good. Um, if you scroll all the way down to exercise nine, all right, um, I added this urinalysis physiology activity. This is worth 20 points. And as long as you attempt to do it, you're, you're, everybody's gonna get their 20 points. But I just want to pull it up because the, ur the, the urinalysis strip looks a little complex. So I want to describe to you what you're looking at. All right, so when you go to do the assignment, you're going to see these pictures. This is a urinalysis strip with all these little square pads on it, right? Now, we're only concerned with, in the question, here, pH, they added a couple on the assignment. pH, protein, glucose, ketones, blood, and the leukocytes. So where do you see that at on the urinalysis? Well, this is a, ur this is a urinalysis strip that's been dipped. It's a control normal urine sample. Now, this one's been dipped. You let it stay in there for several seconds, then you pull it out and then let it sit some of the reactions take place right away and we're looking for color changes. Some of the reactions take a little bit of time, but nonetheless, we look for a color change. Over here is what's on the urinalysis bottle that you compare your strip to. And those are the color pads. The difference in color is a difference in normal, which you see here. These are what the normal colors are supposed to look like. And then all of the abnormal ranges over here, right? So what do we have to look for? Well, we have to deal with pH. And of course, pH is right here. And it looks like they're just going to give, give you the number. I, I, I don't know if all of them are like this, but they might just give you the number. And of course, 6.2 is normal. I just told you the range is 4.5 to 8. So in this little box, you would just write normal negative or normal, normal slash negative, right? And of course, everything is gonna be normal and negative because this is a control normal sample. So in the little box, you would write negative, normal or normal negative, okay? So you have pH right here, you can see the color. This is our normal color. And then you see how the color changes. The only problem with this is that it doesn't show you a, the color that is below this color. And so you'll be able to see if, if the color is brighter than this, see how it starts to get dimmer and then starts to turn into the greens and blues. As you get to the lighter greens and in the blue region, this is more alkaline. If it's becoming more orangey yellow, 
orange, orange, bright orange, that means acidic. You'll see the color change. Um, blood, not supposed to be in the urine. That's your normal color. So any color on the outside of that, if it's in one of the case studies, you would just put um, positive abnormal. You don't have to worry about the actual numbers, all right? Um, ketones, right here, that's the ketones. Here's your normal color for ketone. That's our normal color. You would compare your strip to that. If it gets darker, it gets darker, it gets darker, that means it's abnormal. They're not supposed to be in the urine. So if the color is not the color, that's the normal color, and this little part will always be in the picture. The part you're comparing to your patient is going to be over here. So here's a normal patient. I'm comparing it to the normal uh, values over here. If this ketone color is different than that little pink, you would have to write in your box positive abnormal or high, something like that. Um, glucose, another one, obviously not supposed to be there, right? Here's your the color, it's supposed to be this little blue. If it's anything but that blue, it's abnormal. You have to write positive high or positive abnormal high, whatever you want to write, right? Something like that. So is everybody kind of following me? Yes. I hope so, good. Now here's that case study I was just looking at in our manual. Here's that 82 year old woman with uh, and this says ED, it's supposed to say ER, brought to the ER, not erectile dysfunction. I don't know why they never call it that, but brought to the, well, emergency department is probably what that means. So she's brought to the ER, you know, because she's having problems. They know that she has uh, arthritis. She overtook aspirin. Now, here's her urinalysis strip right here. They call for a urinalysis. The pH down here, see how I told you they, they gave you the real number, but you can, because look at this, here's the pH uh, uh, row. Look how orange that is. That orange it on, on this little bottle that we have for lab, it doesn't go below 5.0. So this is really acidic. It's a lot lower than five because it's a brighter orange than that. So they go ahead and give you the value. So in here, you can just write, low acidic because 3.8 is below the normal range, right? Now you would then go through what's the protein and you find your protein. Here's protein. Oh, protein is normal. The color is the same. What's your glucose? Well, here, ooh, glucose is the same. So you would write, if it's normal, you write normal negative or negative normal in the box. So is everybody with me? Yes. All right. So that's how you read the strip. So for each one of your patients, and then you have some questions, you, you guys can look it up and try and answer the questions. And if you have problems with it, I can, we can talk about it in some detail next week, uh, because some of this is going to coincide with our acid base lab. Um, here's our next patient, 76 year old man. He has some, a problem. He has high, high blood pressure, hypertension. What's his pH? That's the first thing we always look for. Well, his pH is on the low end, but it's still considered normal, right? So even though it's a little low, it's still on in the normal range. 4.5 to 8 would be considered normal. So you could write in here normal pH or whatever, normal. Just write normal. Then look at the protein. Look at the glucose. Look at the ketones. See what's wrong. If something is abnormal, you're going to write abnormal high, abnormal high, abnormal high. A or in the blood, you would write abnormal and abnormal because, well, any of them, is, they're not supposed to be in the, in the urine, all right? All right, so that's how you do that. So I want you guys to try and attempt to do that. 